the um you know, whatever your baseline is probably treasuries you know to your notes or five year notes or whatever they will come down a lot not right away it's we may still be a month or two away from, on this but they'll come down a lot the uh interest rates are a lagging indicator everyone's like well how could interest rates be um you know going up if we're in a recession the answer is um as you get close to recession who knew who figures it out first well the fed figures it out last they're usually the last to know wall street is second last to know the people who figure it out first are actual business people entrepreneurs mm -hmm. restaurant owners dry cleaners taxi drivers um or even medium-sized businesses um they see it uh, uh, you know if you're in the trucking business it's it's real time uh you know if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed you're not you're not moving anything by truck uh so there are certain businesses that are concurrent but the the stock market is saying uh yeah the feds raising rates inflation is coming down but we think they're already at the terminal rate but not only that we think they're going to get the memo that that the fed will figure that out uh before they get to five and a quarter before they raise rates in may maybe even march you know maybe they're done um and because of a recession uh this is these soft landing goldilocks scenario where the market's right the fed's wrong but the fed will realize that the market's actually right and cut rates you know and if you're going to cut rates buy stocks that's like wall, wall street always ends every analysis with buy stocks so here here we see wall street in real time kind of bidding up tech stocks because the fed's going to pivot and cut rates um when in fact powell's thinking no that's not happening until 2024 so that's what the fed thinks is happening uh the market thinks that powell is over tightening that inflation will come down faster and the pivot will happen sooner and that's why we've seen a little bit of a rally in stocks recently so so you, you have the fed narrative that's plan a you have the market's version of what the fed's actually doing which is plan b my estimate is that they they're already past the terminal rate they don't know it they don't think so but they are and as I said, inflation is going to come down a lot faster than than anyone expects. Um, I talked about how the Fed is blundering because they're raising rates too high, too fast, etc. And they are. But the Fed has always said, we don't worry about inflation. We don't like it, but we know how to get rid of it. We just raise rates and maybe they got to raise them longer and further than people expect. And maybe it's painful. There are costs involved, but they can kill inflation just by raising rates. They don't know how to stop deflation. I mean, how do you stop deflation? You can't raise rates. That'll make it worse. You can go to zero, but but that doesn't. Once you're at zero, you're at zero. QE doesn't work, by the way. It's been tried to the tune of like nine trillion dollars, but the the empirical evidence is that it's just you know they 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 do QE by buying bonds from the banks, and the banks take the money and give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. That money never goes to the economy. What good does that do? And the answer is it doesn't do any good. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um real estate stocks and and other asset classes so uh yeah i do uh that, that is my view but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts if all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak which we just saw in third quarter gdp which is based on net exports which won't last how, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with with the strongest dollar in 20 years Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? There are two different things. The global economy is, is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to, they're not in, in sync. They, they do, they will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they oh crash you know correct down so in terms of the global economy um i think your use of the word global is very much on point because it's often the case that you know you look around the world you know you've got the united states or you know north america if you want to throw in canada you've got the eu you've got china you've got japan they're all important economies but they can kind of be in different 
uh, parts of the business cycle. And it's not unusual for one part to be in recession, but another part of the world is like doing better. So that these the uh, phrase locomotive theory, you know, the locomotive is going to pull us all out of the ditch, you know, and, and we'll get going. So it's not unusual to have recessions in the United States or Europe or particular countries in Europe or Japan. I mean, Japan said nine recessions since 1989. I mean, nine. Uh, I consider that one long 30 year depression. That's that's a debate for another day, but I would just, that's how I would describe Japan. But it, it usually, um, you know, one's not doing so well and another part of the world's doing better. Uh, that's not the case. What is happening right now, I see it, but there's a, you know, an awful lot of data to back it up, is that we are going into or may already be in a global recession. So the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession based on based on a lot of factors, some of which we, we've spoken about. Now, the other half of your question, which is you know important to listeners, is what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. So the Fed story kind of goes like this. The, the Fed, uh, you know, forecasting what the Fed's going to do is the easiest thing I do. It's because it's not because I have a crystal ball or I'm smarter than anyone else. The Fed actually tells you. All you have to do is listen and believe them. Now, a lot of people don't listen or they listen like, oh, the Fed will never do that. They, they will. They actually mean it. You know, Japan had the famous lost decade. Well, the lost decade was 20 years ago. Started in 1990 through 2000. Japan's now almost at the end of their third lost decade. The United States has had a lost decade from uh, 2007. Uh, we're probably, if something doesn't change, either in terms of policy or a collapse, something gets worse. But absent that, uh, we're going to remain in this kind of punk 2% growth as far as the eye can see. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, uh, second quarter GDP, Atlanta Fed predicts, you know, 4.5%. Yeah, but we've had 4 and 5% quarters in the last nine years. They don't last. You get these spikes, you get a real good, you know, 4% print, and then the next quarter is 2%, and the one after that is 0 0.5 or maybe even a negative quarter. So the headwinds, demographic, technological, productivity, psychological, etc., haven't changed, and there's no reason to expect they'll change. So you can't understand debt in isolation. You have to understand debt relative to income. And that debt to GDP ratio, which is something I spent a lot of time looking at, you know, the, the GDP is kind of chugging along, not going up very much, but the debt's going like this. The debt to GDP ratio is getting worse. Uh, looks the problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is, yours, you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will do that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies, uh, and not just gold, gold, yeah, but um, I recently invested in a lithium mine. Uh, I think, I think, <laughs> I think the the climate alarmists, I think the, I, I, the Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Uh, this is a scam, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs, whether it's whether you like it or not. The fact is, uh, it's going to go on. So the lithium's in short supply, uh, graphite, you know, et cetera. So there is a portfolio you can have, which is natural resource oriented, that will uh, do well, even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about. Slugger cash, absolutely, maybe as much as 30 percent. I like treasury notes, 10-year uh, treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five-year notes, two-year notes. They're going to come down a lot, not right away, not tomorrow morning, but um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is uh, you know, a recession and interest rates will follow. They're a lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Um, uh, gold, I always recommend 10% slice. Absolutely, there's a 
hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO1. DBO1 is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously basic bond math, interest rates come down, the value, the, the price of the bond goes up. They're just invert, it's a little counterintuitive, but rates come down, the bond goes up. The question is how much? And the lower the interest rate, the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're gonna have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher you know, as the DBO one is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive. Right. But the, the, the lower the rate, uh, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop. That's the basic thing. So yeah, when you're you, you go from three percent to two percent, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Yeah, but based on what we were talking about, get. Um, I, I would get uh, silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, the monster box, that's, uh, you know, a bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mint, it's treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. Um, they'll feed your family for, you know, probably a year. And uh, it, uh, um, they run, you know, it's a market price, but, uh, you know, be around ten, twelve thousand dollars uh, for a monster box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlights, you know, you just have one stick in a safe place. Yeah, I, I like them both. And, you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and uh, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist, but I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver's along for the ride. There's, a, there's, no, there's not going to be a world of $3,000 gold and $20 silver. That world doesn't exist. If gold's at $3,000, silver's going to be pushing 100. So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the even the court, even the eight gram coin I mentioned, the quarter ounce American gold eagle, still five hundred bucks. That's like pulling a five hundred dollar bill out of your wallet. You know, it's it's a lot for groceries. Yeah, income producing real estate. I wouldn't get into commercial real estate, residential. Uh, yeah, the, the prices are you know um, home prices are coming down uh, a little more in some markets than others, but. Uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a, in a place like, you know, uh, someplace people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know they're, 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but, you know, it's like buying a, a 10 year bond. You know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland, uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. I, I like private equity and it's, you know, you got accredited investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But, um, you know, that, that there are some, uh, you know, some good deals in the mining sector um, I like. Uh, ser seriously, everything we talked about is sort of pales in comparison to what's going on in Ukraine. We're kind of on a march toward nuclear war. If you talk about what they call legacy media, mainstream media, so Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, right. CNN, that run of characters. The first thing you discover is, I know a lot of these people, I've been on all these programs, I've done this for a long time. I spent a lot of time in Washington, I had dinner with most of the, or lunch or whatever, dinner actually more often with most of the names you've heard about. Um, some of them are fine, some of them are nice. A lot of them are either not that bright, or, I mean, they're good on camera, they need, uh, or whatever, they got a desk at the Washington Post, they're not that bright. Or if they've got some degrees, they've been kind of indoctrinated. We're at the point now, uh, I mean, a lot of these people are 28, 33, 34 years old, There's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, good, you're, you're in the heart of your career. 
but that means they graduated from school in uh, you know 2016, 2017, or whatever, um, and they're thoroughly indoctrinated. Uh, I'm, I, I, um, I mean, I went to school when uh, uh, we learned, we learned it was pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I had one program where the they graded you needed a C plus average to graduate, I mean, but they graded on a C minus curve. So you're like. How do you get it? How do you how do you even get a C plus if they're writing on a C minus curve? The answer is people quit. And in other words, you were you were trying to struggle to be. I did an A in partnership taxation. And I'm proud of that. But my the standards are down. The mission standards are down. Affirmative action takes over. When you get into the classroom, I don't care where you're at. You know, Ivy League, whatever. It's just indoctrination. The market has a way of sorting it out. I mean, the revenues are down, advertising is down, the viewers are down, subscriptions are down. Eventually, as you said, they will go out of business, not overnight. And then new media channels will arise. And you know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet, but there's a lot of good stuff. And um, you know, if you want to keep tabs on the war in Ukraine, you have to know where to look. It's not easy, but there are a number of channels with. And I'm talking about you know, military officers, you know, colonels you know, brigadier generals, um, people on the ground in Ukraine, not, you know, some studio in New York, you can find out what's going on. But I think my intelligence training is helpful because you have to be very persistent and know how to do it. We may have um, a very bad recession, possibly worse than 2008. So tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and growth is going to come down and inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Maybe at the bottom, you know, and the bottom might not be till late 2023. Okay. Yeah. There's, there are opportunities to, to buy the bottom, but we'll be nowhere near the bottom. Bear market rallies are, are really interesting. Some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything, but for a couple of days or weeks, even, uh, uh, it's hey, the bottom's in, and you buy stocks, et cetera. So you have, you have to watch out for that. So we're flying into a really bad recession. The stock market's starting to get the message, but you know, you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of the, some of the buy the dips people are still around. So count on them to, you know, buy into a, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd, you know, remember in uh, 2000, 2001, the NASDAQ dropped 80%. And a lot of people got out, but a lot of, they said, well, just hold on to it. Well, it did come back, but it took until 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime. You know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the, the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake-up call and have to cut rates. And cutting rates, that's the pivot. They're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks, so buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. It prevailed in uh, late July and most of August. The stock market did go up. There was a, there was a decent rally uh, in the middle of what's you know become a, a bear market uh, based on this Fed narrative that they were going to have to cut rates. There are two huge fallacies in that uh, in that narrative. The first one is, uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates, we're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've, I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did. Uh, and he meant it. Um, he knows there's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, Unemployment is going to go up. He said that he tied unemployment to um, killing, you know, basically demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said, we're, that's how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to you know, get a wake up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food, and that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that Let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. 
Now, what Powell, which is their target, so what Powell said is, we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive, a restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's that he said that might last for a year, all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now again, this, this can change, but but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say, forecasting the Fed is the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now the hard part is understanding how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis. But telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. So, so the stock market notion that somehow they'll be cutting rates is just false. I, uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours. Actually, you know, I was you know I was in the room with the. Treasury and Italian finance ministry and 19 banks and you know a thundering herd of lawyers trying to trying to save the world. But uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. There was a four billion dollar all cash. You know you could you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time. It was just hey the Fed wants us to do this so let's just do it. Um, so uh, so that worked. But um, it was it was you know it was a very close call. They would have shut down Tokyo and then around the world, London and finally New York. And you know they would have opened days later. But that's how uh, with trillions of dollars of losses, it would have been worse than what actually happened in in 2008. It didn't happen. But there was no economic recession at the time. That was and that's that confuses a lot of people because and particularly if you're if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference. There are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan- an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now, NASDAQ collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in NASDAQ. There was, there was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't, no banks, no banks failed, no major brokerages failed, et cetera. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. Uh, October 19, 1987, interesting, stock market fell 22% in one day not a week or a month, but one day down 22%. And that was a financial crisis, but there was no, there was no recession. Uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together. And 2008 was an example. There we had both, but I would encourage analysts to separate those two things. Again, they came together. It was, it was horrific, but, um, but they can happen separately. My, my point is, uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening uh, on top of a world where growth is deaccelerating, inventories are sky high. You know the funny thing about the supply chain, we all remember headline: you know, supply chain is broken down. Uh, you know the, the shelves are bare. So all true that that was happening at the time, and that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did um, and inventory managers, they they doubled their orders. They said, well, we're triple the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down and I want just a normal amount, I better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what I want. And they did. Well, what happened was by the summer, some of that pressure had been alleviated. And here come the shipments into the warehouses that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the Fed was destroying demand. And so demand drops off a cliff, uh, retail sales drop off a cliff, the warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters, and now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, You don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like who wants to buy, you know, summer dress in uh, December? And not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices, uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness. The, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which 
uh, is is not a good measure of um, of what's going on in the labor force. So my expectation is the recession is coming. It's going to be really bad. Um, inflation is going to come down fast, but not quite fast enough for the Fed. Uh, they're going to keep raising rates, destroying demand, raising unemployment. And we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. The Fed can't escape the room. So if inflation stays where it is, the Fed can't get interest rates to a real level uh, without causing a recession, which will sink the stock market. But if even if inflation comes down a little bit, that'll be a sign of recession. So you're raising rates into a recession, which will cause a recession. You end up in a recession either way. Um, it's just a question of whether the Fed persists or throws in the towel. Now, we've seen this movie before. What's going on is an exact replay of what happened between 2013 and 2019. May 2013, Bernanke announces the taper. Expectation is they're going to start the taper in September. He chickens out. They start the taper in November 2013. They finish the taper in November 2014. Then here comes Yellen. and she's going to raise rates. Take out the word patient from the, from the statement. She doesn't raise rates until December 2015. And then she doesn't raise them again until December 2016. They went a whole year between two 25 basis point rate cuts. And then here comes Powell and then boom, okay, 25 basis points, boom, boom, boom. Gets them up to two and a quarter, which is where they want it to be. And gets the balance sheet down to eh, about three and a half trillion. They want to get it down to about two and a half trillion. But he's, he's got rates about where he wants them. He's got the balance sheet on its way down uh, and uh, he's normalizing. And what happens? The stock market crashes 20% between October 1st 2018 and December 24th, 2018. That was the famous Christmas Eve massacre where the stock market fell 3% in one day. But the Fed's still tightening. The Fed tightened like a week before the Christmas Eve massacre. They tightened into the weakness. They were getting very close to crashing the stock market. They took it down 20% in three months, getting close to crashing it. So what happens next? First week of January, Powell comes out. Okay, we're not going to raise interest rates anymore. We're going to be patient. They use all these code words. We're going to be patient. Then he starts cutting rates. Then he starts QE. I forget if it's eight or nine, whatever. Lost, lost track of QE. He starts QE eight, let's say. And then that takes you into 2020. And here comes the pandemic. And rates go down to zero. And the balance sheet goes to $7 trillion. They were back where they were in May of 2013 except worse, because now the balance sheet was even bigger than it was then. A complete failure. So who thinks they're going to be more successful this time? They're doing the same thing. It's going to happen faster this time because the market saw that whole seven-year fiasco from May to 2013 to May 2020, a seven-year round-trip failure. The same thing's going to happen, but it's going to happen faster this time because like, the market knows that the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. So the Fed's tightening into weakness. One of two things is going to happen. And it's not clear which, but it's going to be one or the other. They're going to keep tightening and keep tightening and keep tightening and try to get a handle on inflation and crash the stock market, or they're going to lose their nerve, back off on the tightening, and then inflation is just going to rip, which will also crash the stock market. So take your pick, but um, it's going to be one or the other. But this idea of a soft landing is nonsense. The 2021 thesis was that, you know, inflation grew. Part of it was base effects because, you know, the, the way the government calculates inflation, it's monthly data compared to the year before. So it's year over year, monthly, then annualized. Uh, and so one could easily explain inflation in April, May, June 2021, because you were comparing it to 2020, which was the worst recession since 1946. But the base effects would run off uh, in September, October, November, but the inflation persisted, even though the base effects were gone. So now it's like, okay, this is real inflation is coming from somewhere else. It was coming from the supply chain, which the Fed can't do anything about either because the Fed doesn't drill for oil, they don't build pipelines and they don't grow wheat. The Fed can't do anything about any of those things. And that's where um, the war and the sanctions and the continuation of COVID played a role. So, you know, I just say you can, you can have your own uh, views, but you can't have your own data. The data is clear, the inflation is here. The supply chains are getting worse. But these supply chain disruptions didn't start with the war. They didn't even start with the pandemic. They started with Trump's trade war beginning in 2018. <laughs> I found a very good book on that uh, written by um, uh, Lauren LaRocco. Uh, and what's interesting about her book is that she finished it in late 2019. So it's almost like a controlled experiment. It was pre-pandemic. It's easy to say that the pandemic disrupted the supply chain, which it did, and the war disrupted the supply chain, which it did. But here we have a very rigorous study of what was happening to supply chains before either one.
And the answer is they were a mess. They were a mess back then because of tariffs on China and China redirecting soybean purchase orders from the United States to Brazil. That sounds easy because Brazil grows soybeans. Well, guess what? You got to get the ships to Brazilian ports. You got to rearrange all the logistics lanes. That was happening already. Pandemic made it worse. And now the war makes it uh, even worse than that. Yeah, the world is breaking up. Uh, we're decoupling. We're globalization is over. There'll be a new form of it. Uh, it's not the end of world trade, but you're going to see you know maybe the the five eyes you know uk us canada australia new zealand and friends in western europe form uh, a new trading bloc but exclude china and russia it'll be a little bit more like the cold war i talked to paul Walker about this but here's what happened in the 70s now it started as cost push inflation it was the arab oil embargo in 1973 after the 1973 war the israel arab war uh, then the arabs threw the embargo on us the price of oil quadrupled. It went from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. It sounds cheap, but that's a 300% increase. And then uh, we had a severe stock market crash and recession in 1974, which at the time was the worst since the Great Depression. We've had worse ones since, but at the time that was the worst recession since the Great Depression. Then we come out of that and along comes the Fed, you know, and um, we went off the gold standard. Nixon uh, had an easy monetary policy in 72. It was a little earlier for his re-election effort, etc. So here comes the inflation. But what happened along the way, and then he had another Arab oil, actually an Iranian oil embargo in 1979 after the Ayatollah took over. So there were there were double oil shocks. That was a supply-driven cost push inflation. But along the way, it morphed into demand pull. It, it morphed into a demand-driven inflation. Now, I lived through it. I mean, I was a young up-and-coming lawyer at Citibank and a senior officer living in New York City. And that was the world where if you wanted anything, new furniture, TV set, vacation, whatever, you ran out, you dropped everything, ran out and did it because the price was going up so fast. So that's instructive in two ways. Number one, um, it shows that the Fed's always behind the curve. It shows that these things can persist a lot longer than people expect. But in my view, most importantly, because I think things are going to happen more quickly now, it shows inflation morphing from cost push to demand pull, morphing from something on the supply side to a psychological shift on the consumer side. And Volcker crushed it, but um, at a huge cost. Unemployment was uh, about 11%. He took interest rates to 20%. How does that feel? You know, mortgagors and student loan holders and uh, others, you know, 20%. You're talking about 40% on credit cards in that world. And people forget, you know, well, doesn't inflation, don't you have high growth or whatever, at least or low unemployment? No, we had stagflation. We had inflation and high unemployment. There were three recessions between 1974 and 1982. We had three, 1974, 1980, and 1981, which lasted until 1982. And by the way, uh, people lost confidence in the dollar. In the late 70s, Jimmy Carter's treasury issued what they call Carter bonds. The US treasury issued debt in Swiss francs. Now it was treasury debt, you had the treasury credit, but it was denominated in Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. That's how bad things were. The bond market is telling a completely different story, by the way, and, and this is a little more esoteric, uh, but uh, if you look at e um, yield curves, look at the treasury yield curve, euro dollar futures yield curve, German bunds yield curve, they're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's gonna get the memo, they're gonna cut rates, the pivot and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no. This is bad and it's going to get worse and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. See, when these inversions start, sometimes they're a year forward, like, hey, look out, look at the Euro dollar futures yield curve a year from now, man, that thing is inverted. But what happens is as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Okay, the um, you know, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, to your notes or five year notes or whatever, they will come down a lot. Not right away. It's, we may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot 
and then corporate yields will go up a lot because of the recession, because of deterioration, increased bankruptcies, reduced revenues, you know, et cetera. So those spreads will blow out. And it's important to remember, um, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. They see it. Uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not moving anything by truck. So there are certain businesses that are concurrent. The yield curves I was talking about are very good forward indicators. They tell you what's going to happen next. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, there's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then, then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loans. And then interest rates will start to come down. Interest rates peak after the recession has already begun. So interest rates may not have peaked yet. I mean, you know, even the treasury market. So that's not unusual. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Well, the answer is they have to announce the layoffs. There's all kinds of statutes, you know, SEC. So if I'm going to fire 10,000 people, I got to tell the world I'm firing 10,000 people. It doesn't mean I fire them that day. I might fire them you know, on a rolling basis over the next 30 days. And it doesn't mean they walk out the door empty handed and head for the unemployment office. I might give them three months severance, six months severance, et cetera. And so when do they actually show up to the unemployment office and say, you know, give me a check? It might not be till this spring. So the layoff announcements are out there, but the unemployment rate hasn't budged because there is a lag three months. But that's why I said interest rates uh, lag the business cycle and they do. Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. By the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. But we know enough right now to know that number's going up. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. So when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30 percent in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly. That may happen. In fact, I expect it will, but, but we're not there yet. So there may be a pivot you know, in late August, but, or, you know, July thereabouts, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. And I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. 
and I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm the storyteller here, but um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid the fed's doing what they're doing right or wrong okay they're they're doing what they're doing the market has their own interpretation i agree with the market certainly the bond market that the fed has probably over tightened and they may pivot uh to say that there could be a rate cut you know rate cut in august maybe i wouldn't rule that out but for a really bad reason in other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Supply chain is not part of the economy. Supply chain is the economy. And I was, if you want to understand the economy, you're, you're really talking about the supply chain at every aspect. You know, something as simple as a, a loaf of bread, you know, you buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store. Like, okay, well, I guess it came from a baker and I guess they took it from the bakery to the store by truck. So there's a supply chain. Well, that's about as simple a version of the supply chain as you can imagine. You have to just start going from there. I was like, well, did the bread come in a plastic wrap? wrapper or a paper wrapper or well, that wrapper came from somebody where the truck come from well, obviously a truck manufacturer where the driver come from somebody had to make a career choice and and be trained and what about the diesel fuel in the truck you know that, well, that came from refinery and that came from oil exploration uh then you get back to the baker and it's like oh well i guess he had an oven or she had an oven you know where did that come from and then you find out that the ovens are you know, industrial ovens have parts from 25 different countries and, and so forth. Well, without belaboring that point, you get back to the farmer and the wheat and the fertilizer and, and everything else. And really what's called the extended supply chain. And you're like, wait a second, that's a huge number of countries, a huge number of imports and a big part of the economy, which it is. And then every link in that supply chain I described has its own supply chain behind it to get to source materials and intermediate manufacturing and so forth. And then that's for a loaf of bread. Well, what about your car, your furniture, your clothes, and, and, and on and on and on. Once you start thinking about what supply chains are, you realize it's just the cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy. So, you know, the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process. And I have whole chapters on that talk about China, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. And you say, well, yeah, the interesting topics, but what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, etc. Again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft, they need titanium and aluminum, where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia I can go kind of on and on there. China, you know, everyone says, well, they slowed down because of the, the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. Shanghai, a city of 26 million people. Beijing, a city of 22 million people. They were both locked down entirely last spring. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, 
nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers, people had to get to work. You had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns and obviously very, very detrimental to the economy. Um, now, those have died down a little bit, and China's saying, well, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. So what's new? What, why are supply chains breaking down? What kind of, what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. The first was you had a combination of increased computing power, algorithms, artificial intelligence, better data collections and new models. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse, the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners in uh, both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the T Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down U.S.-China relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. The two countries were distant. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations. And then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then, then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period between uh, 1989 and 1992, um, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics. China kind of re-enters the game, and all this. This was this was globalization. So now, all of a sudden, you had the science I described. You know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from uh, you know Shanghai to Seattle or you know London to, uh, to to Hong Kong of course. So this was true globalization, much larger scale, much much longer supply chains and it worked. And so this was a period I call supply chain 1.0, 30 year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, why did it break down around 2019? Three things. A lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, oh yeah, COVID, that disrupted everything. That was the problem. And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, that was the problem. And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it. it made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. So he put uh, Trump put tariffs on appliances and solar panels. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do? to strike back. Well, at the time, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein. They don't have enough. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them. And China said, well, what can we buy from the U.S. just to kind of balance the books a little bit? And the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. You got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities, et cetera. The point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the U.S. to Brazil. Beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six-month contracts. They want five-year contracts or at least three-year contracts, and they got them. And so now all of a sudden, China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil. But this scramble of global supply chains, 
Now, what are the U.S. farmers doing? We're still growing the soybeans. We can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, okay, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. And then this went on and on because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So, and it escalated from there. Now, again, COVID made it worse. The war in Ukraine made it worse. But it, it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just, you know, kind of an arbitrary date with a 30 year period period of supply chain 1.0. Now we're getting to supply chain 2.0, but we're not there yet. We're in this like messy, in between, inefficient, muddling through period where things are broken, but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. You have to understand it took us 30 years to build this. We blew it up in about three years. It's not going to come back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years, or maybe longer to rebuild in, in some form.
The first point I would make is that global recessions are rare. Recessions in individual countries or economic communities like the EU do happen with some uh, some frequency, but a global recession is different. Uh, it's usually the case that even when uh, a large group is in recession, somebody else is expanding. China, you know, the 70s, they used to, 1970s used to call the U.S. the locomotive. You know, if Germany was in recession, somehow the U.S. could kind of power through, although the U.S. itself had three recessions between 1974 and, and 1982. But a world recession is rare. Uh, we had one in uh, around the time of the 2008 financial crisis, even though Australia did power through it okay. Uh, and uh, certainly in 2020, during the pandemic lockdowns, but they're unusual. As I say, it's usually one one group is in a little bit of trouble, but another group powers through and even can pull the recession country or group out of difficulty. But um, when global GDP declines, that's rare. We are heading for uh, exactly that. To understand that, let's um, let's take a look at some of the, the largest uh, economic uh, groupings. And I'll start with the, uh, the United States. Now, the United States had a mild recession in the first half of 2022. If you blinked, you missed it. First quarter GDP was negative, uh, not a lot, about um, 1.6 percent. A second quarter GDP was also negative, about nine tenths of one percent. So first half as a whole, uh, we had negative GDP. The rule of thumb definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. That's the rule of thumb. We had that. It's in the data. Having said that, it was mild. And third quarter GDP uh, and fourth quarter bounced back. Uh, but if there was a recession, it was mild. What I'm talking about is a much more severe recession, uh, much, much more difficult, uh, much sharper drop in economic output uh, beginning about now with rising unemployment, uh, slowing industrial output, uh, slowing retail sales, and importantly uh, for investors, uh, a very sharp decline in inflation. So this is one of the kind of mystifying points about the U.S. stock market. I mean, it seems straightforward to me, but the market has their own dynamic. They're saying, well, um, if the Fed raises rates the way I've described and they cause a recession, the Fed's going to have to cut rates. That's called the pivot, the Fed pivot, and lower rates are good for tech stocks or buy stocks. But think about that for a second. What if inflation comes down faster than the Fed thinks? And I think it may, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that. What if inflation comes down really fast uh, and they get to the, the target rate sooner than they think? Um, does that mean they might have to cut? Well, it, it might, but what's good about that for stocks? I mean, if that happens, no one ever says, why did that happen? They just say, well, inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, so buy stocks. It's like, well, inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, but if it does, it's because we're in a very severe recession, exactly what I'm forecasting. And so if that's the case, stocks are going to plunge, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent. So don't root for lower rates, or if you're forecasting lower rates, understand what that means. It doesn't mean the Fed chickened out doesn't mean life is wonderful and you should buy tech stocks. It means that we're in the very severe recession that I described, and I think we will end up there. Uh, and therefore, stocks are going to plunge. So, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for, as they say. Um, my forecast is, yeah, they are going to raise rates. Uh, they're going to over tighten. They're going to cause a very severe recession. Um, and when they do, they may pivot at that time, but it won't be for good reasons. It'll be for very bad reasons, meaning we're in a recession and stocks have plunged. So don't don't buy into the Wall Street chatter as far as uh, as far as that's concerned, because they say the Fed's going to over tighten. Now, why doesn't the Fed know this? Well, because they never know, because they have the worst forecasting record of any institution I can think of. Their, their entire history since 1913 is one blunder after another. Uh, and this will just be the latest uh, in a long series. And so just to kind of summarize um, the Fed's on a course, we know exactly what it is because they told us. All you have to do is listen to them and believe them. They're going to raise rates, let high rates do its work, do their work, um, and see the inflation come down and maybe in 2024 cut rates. Uh, what I expect is they are going to raise rates for the next couple of meetings, exactly as I've described, but they're going to over tighten. The signs of recession are, are already present. The Fed's not looking at them. I'll come back to what they are, by the way. Uh, and we'll be in a very severe recession for a lot of reasons. And that's going to mean a plunge in stock prices. So if the Fed cuts rates, don't cheer too loudly because it'll be in a world where um, uh, severe recession, higher unemployment and crashing stock prices are the norm. I'd like to uh, finish on a, uh, can't call it a happy note, but global liquidity crisis. Now, I talked about a global recession and people go, well, isn't, isn't that like your liquidity crisis? No, um, a recession or a depression um, is very different than a liquidity crisis or a financial panic. 
They're two different things. They can, can and do happen separately. In 2008, we had both. In 2008, a recession or depression and a financial panic converged. So they can happen together, but they don't have to. They can happen individually. What we're, what we're in for looks like a global financial crisis and a global recession at the same time coming sooner than later. Now, why do I say that? Um, there's a global dollar shortage. People go, wait a second. The Fed printed $9 trillion, uh, which they did in 2020. It's come down since then, but they did print that much money. Uh, how could there be a global dollar shortage? Well, what people don't understand is that behind the curtain, off balance sheet, this is off balance sheet. You got to go read the footnotes and understand what you're reading. There are one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And for those not familiar with the Q word, one quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So I just said the Fed printed $9 trillion. Maybe it's down to $7 trillion. Yeah. But you have a thousand trillion dollars of derivatives. Uh, and they have to be supported with collateral. Not 100%, not even 10%. I mean, kind of 1% or 2% is enough. But when you're in a liquidity crisis, banks are extremely choosy about which collateral they'll accept to support this quadrillion dollar inverted pyramid of derivatives. Um, and right now, what they're saying, because this evolves, it gets worse. It doesn't happen overnight. It can become acute overnight, but it happens over the course of a year or longer. What we see, the banks are saying, I, I don't want I don't want corporate bonds as collateral. I don't want your mortgages as collateral. I don't even want 10 year treasury notes as collateral. The only collateral I want are, are short term US treasury bills. Treasury bills have a maximum maturity of one year, 360 days, but there can be four week bills, eight week bills, six month bills, et cetera. That's the, only, that's the best form of collateral. It's the most liquid, easily traded, low volatility, easy to repledge is by far the best form of collateral. That's all the banks want right now. But if you're a foreign bank, you need dollars to buy the dollar based collateral. If you want treasury bills that are denominated dollars, you need dollars to buy the bills. That's why the US dollar is so strong. People go, wait a second. You know, the US has a, you know, a multi trillion dollar annual budget deficit, uh, a massive trade deficit, uh, 130%. 2% debt to GDP ratio, $31 trillion in debt. Uh, you're going into recession. How can the dollar be so strong? The answer is everything I just said has nothing to do with the demand for dollars in international foreign exchange markets. What's driving the demand for dollars is the need to get dollars to buy dollar denominated collateral, specifically treasury bills, to post as collateral to support the one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And that's going to persist for until the system crashes, which it's in the process of doing. What has been happening in the U.S. economy? The Fed prints all this money, yet that money doesn't lose a lot of value. Look at the exchange rate of the dollar versus other currencies. We've had this massive explosion of money printing, big increase in the Fed's balance sheet. But on a relative basis, the dollar hasn't lost a lot of value relative to other currencies, despite the fact that we've dramatically increased the supply. Imagine if the United States existed as an island we didn't trade with any other nation so any money the federal reserve printed just stayed within our borders it didn't go anywhere right and so the only stuff you could buy with the money the fed printed was the stuff that we made here domestically because that was the only source of goods well obviously the effect would have been much different because if the fed prints a bunch of money and we don't have any stuff we're not producing we don't have factories making stuff then the prices are obviously going to go way up. But there was kind of like an escape valve that allowed the Fed to print a lot of money and it not push up the price of goods. And that was the fact that we have a whole world out there that was able to produce the goods that the U.S. economy couldn't. And we were able to take all the money that the Federal Reserve printed and then use that money to buy all those goods that were made outside the United States. So the Fed prints money, 
right? The government gets it, sends it to Americans. Americans take that money and buy Chinese goods with it. And now the Chinese send us their goods and we send the Chinese our money. So the money the Fed creates is shipped abroad. So it's not in America bidding up prices, but now the goods that the Chinese produced, they get shipped to America. So now we have all those extra goods to keep a lid on prices. And if you look at the breakdown of the CPI between goods and services, if you just look at services, you've seen a substantial increase in prices even with the government rigging the CPI because the cost of services has actually risen by more than what the government admits. But if you strip out goods, you'll see a much bigger increase in prices. Why? Because we can't easily import those services. There isn't a foreign alternative. You can't outsource that stuff because the services have to be performed locally. But when it comes to goods, more and more goods have been outsourced to cheaper production economies like China. And so that's kept the lid on goods prices. And so when you average the goods prices with the service prices, that's kept the measured rate of inflation lower. I mean, think about the low production costs in a country like China, which, you know, 20 years ago, they were just starting out. They went through a long period of time where they had a communist system not just in name, but in practice. And so you had a lot of very poor people. And as they began to embrace capitalism, wages started at a very low level. And of course, they didn't have a lot of the rules and regulations that we had. Uh, They didn't have all these environmental protections. And so the cost of manufacturing and the cost of labor, capital was all much lower in a country like China. And so we were able to outsource that production in order to keep costs down, even as the Federal Reserve was printing money. And of course, the money that we were printing, we were sending abroad. See, now normally this wouldn't work because if you ran a big trade deficit like the one the U.S. is running, your currency would crash because your trading partners would have all this currency, but they'd have nothing to buy because the whole purpose of trade is that you export to import. You have a concept of comparative advantage. And if as a nation, there are certain things that you can produce efficiently and there are other things that you can't, rather than producing everything, you produce just what you can make efficiently And then you trade that for the things that you don't produce efficiently because maybe your trading partner can produce that more efficiently. And so by everybody concentrating on what they make efficiently and then trading, everybody ends up with more stuff, higher living standards, lower prices. But the goal of your exports is to pay for your imports. You don't just export for the sake of exporting. That's just a waste of resources. You export to pay for your imports. But what about America? You've got China and other countries exporting to the United States. They're not getting imports. They're getting dollars. And because the U.S. is the reserve currency, those dollars are actually valuable. And so our trading partners are content or have been in the past to exchange the products that they produce for the money that we print. Now, their willingness to continue to do that and pursue this arrangement, I think, is coming to an end. I think the world is going to tire of exchanging real goods for our paper, especially when they understand how much less that paper is going to be worth in the future than it is now when they realize the box that the Fed is in with respect to its ability to control inflation and the fact that government deficits are going to keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger, putting more and more pressure on on the Federal Reserve to monetize those deficits. And in fact, the reason that the deficits were able to get so big in the first place was because of this arrangement, because foreigners were willing to hold on to our U.S. treasuries and keep interest rates artificially low that emboldened the government to go even deeper into debt, because normally a government that was this profligate would be punished by higher interest rates and that punishment would change their behavior and cause more fiscal responsibility. But we never got punished. And as a result of that, we continue to pursue 
even more reckless policies than we had in the past. And so foreigners actually helped encourage this. And ultimately now they're going to be the ones that are going to put on the brakes because they're going to stop enabling all of this debt. But it's going to be the Federal Reserve that is going to ultimately replace foreign buyers of U.S. treasuries. But of course, when foreigners buy U.S. treasuries, there's no new dollars created. They buy treasuries with the dollars that already exist. But when the Federal Reserve has to buy those treasuries, they have to produce even more dollars to finance it, which is inflation. And of course, if those dollars stay here, if they're not exported, then they are going to be bidding up prices. And this is what Powell doesn't understand. We are not going to be able to continue to export our inflation to the degree that we did. And we're going to start to see goods prices rising now. And of course, even if the Fed hadn't increased the pace of its money printing, the benefits of outsourcing our production to countries like China was bound to diminish over time as Chinese wages go up, as production costs go up, there is less of a benefit of continuing to shift production abroad. And of course, as we've shifted more and more production abroad, there's less incremental benefit from shifting more. See, in the early days of outsourcing, we got a lot of bang for the buck. But over time, that impact is lessened. And so the benefit that we got of having our consumer prices reduced as a result of that is also getting diminished. So it was going to happen anyway, but we've now dramatically accelerated it. I would say that the Fed's monetary policy will fail or is failing and fiscal policy will fail is in the process of failing, even if gold didn't exist. If you didn't have gold as a, you know, multi-millennial monetary standard, even if gold wasn't there as a reference point, which of course it is, but these policies are failing anyway. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, whenever I hear, you know, fiscal stimulus, I say, well, no, the Fed can print money all day long and the Congress can spend money all day long, but don't call it stimulus. It's not going to have any stimulative effect. We're way, way past the Keynesian multiplier, which is now below one, meaning if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you don't even get a dollar's worth of GDP. You get some numbers, 70, 80 cents. They forget about the multiplier. It's actually now uh, you know, a divider, something that uh, reduces uh, GDP. Well, you don't get the GDP for the borrowing. And same thing with uh, monetary policy, because uh, unlike uh, Milton Friedman, the monetarists, the New York Keynesians, the Austrians, and everyone else, money printing has nothing to do with inflation. And they, they seem to, well, I don't know if they ever knew it, so I can't say they forgot it. So all the money printing and all the deficit spending will not stimulate the economy. And that's true anyway, but gold is signaling that. Look, all markets are try to be forward leaning. Some do it more successfully than others, more <laughs> accurately than others, but they try. I would, I would say that, yeah, people say, you know, the stock market is an efficient discounting mechanism for future events, for what they see in the future. And yeah, they look into the future, here's their forecast, they pick out a discount factor, they, they present value it and say, here's where, where stocks should be today based on where things are going to be, you know, six months or a year from now. And that's what they do sort of mathematically and analytically, except they're always wrong about the forecast. You got to get the forecast right (laughs) if the discounting process is going to mean anything. So markets go through the process, but they always get the future wrong. They're they're not very good at predictive analytics. So um, this creates what I call the gap between the perception and the reality. Reality always wins, but not right away. Sometimes it takes a while. Gold, on the other hand, as very high predictive analytic value, number one. Number two, it's more forward-looking. So gold's kind of telling you where things are going to be maybe a year to 18 months from now instead of six months from now. And so, yeah, so gold is signaling that monetary and fiscal policy will fail and something will else will be tried. Uh, and that ultimately will re, you know result in a much higher price for gold. So gold's just saying, well, let's do it now. You know, look, I've got gold at $15,000 an ounce by 2025. If I'm wrong about that, it'll be sooner and higher. But that's, well, I I consider that a conservative forecast. And we can maybe take a few minutes to go into the analytics behind that. As I've said before, you've heard me say, I don't don't just throw numbers out there to get attention. I don't really care. I do care about getting the analysis right. There's a number of different techniques. And what's interesting is they all point in the same direction. So 
So, you know, it's got to go to 3,000 before it gets to 15,000. It's got to go to 5,000 before it gets to 15,000. So that's my kind of long range forecast. But, you know, it could go down tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't get depressed when it goes down. I don't get euphoric when it goes up. I know where it's going in the long run. That's the important thing for if you're trying to preserve wealth and make money. You know, nothing wrong with making money. I'm all for it. But, uh, but sometimes preserving wealth you know, and risk aversion is a higher priority than just making a lot of money in the short run. But uh, either way, Gold will serve that purpose and uh, you know and preserve wealth over, over that uh, over that time period. Could it go down tomorrow? I guess, yeah. But all the vectors are pointing up uh, very strongly. I mean, I'll give you a, a concrete example. There are three things that drive the price of gold fundamentally. Uh, one that you've already mentioned, which is real interest rates. The lower the real interest rate, the higher the price of gold. Number two, supply and demand. You know, you learn it in your first three days in economics, but it, it still works. Uh, and then uh, number three is geopolitical risk. You know, call it risk off or fear fact, whatever you want to call it, but I, I think of it in geopolitical space. Those three vectors don't all have to point in the same direction. You could have a situation where geopolitical risk is high, pointing to a higher gold price, but real interest rates are, are really high, and that would point to a lower gold price, et cetera. But right now, all three of them are flashing green or maybe flashing gold. The uh, real rates are coming down. Uh, they're still high, by the way. Uh, when, it, when I, I always have to just roll my eyes when uh, like really smart people, uh, Dan Isaacson, uh, Bill Gross, uh, Jeff Gunlock, and I admire them all and I, fo I, I follow them all. But they've, they've all been carried out feet first on this, you know, bond bubble thing, you know, the greatest bond bubble in history and short bonds and the interest rates have nowhere to go but up. They're, they're just failing to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Nominal rates are low. Real rates are not low. When I say low, I mean, show me negative 4%. That's a low real rate. Yeah, you can pick your notes or, or your bills or whatever, but I usually use the 10-year note rate, 10-year uh, treasury, because it's a good proxy for building construction, long-term investment. People don't borrow overnight to build a building. They borrow for seven years if they can, et cetera. So to me, that's my proxy for, for sort of economic growth and, and inflation forecasting. That's uh, it's what, about 70 basis points today. Etc. But inflation is, you know, one, one and a half, uh, take your index. So that puts the real rate, you know, maybe negative 25, negative 50 basis points. Well, thank you very much. But, you know, I remind people in 1980, I borrowed money at 13%, but inflation was 15%. And my borrowings were tax deductible and the tax rate, I lived in New York City at the time, was 50%. So my real after-tax rate was about negative seven. That's a low real rate. So the point is we have a long way to go. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, people are interested in whether the Fed's going to pursue a negative interest rate policy, take the target rate on Fed funds below zero. Legally, they could. It's already been done in Europe and Switzerland and Japan and a few other places. I don't necessarily forecast that. I don't think the Fed necessarily th wants to go there but you can have negative yield to maturity on a 10-year note just when that, whenever the premium is greater than the present value of the coupons it's a negative yield to maturity so you can get there you can get deeply negative rates in secondary market trading regardless of what the fed does and that will happen and so you know in the dbo one dollar value of one basis point is higher as the absolute level of rates gets lower that's just you know duration just bond math 101. So we're going to have huge capital gains in 10-year notes as the yield of maturity goes, you know, towards negative 1%. But that's going to be an enormous boost for gold. Uh, and we're not, we're not even there yet. We're seeing these, uh, we're seeing kind of a spike in gold prices when, they, when real rates are still, you know, relatively high. They're only mildly negative. I was declarative when I said printing money does not cause inflation, and it doesn't. Uh, again, I'll just use the last 12 years as, as Exhibit A. I, we should probably relate to the viewers what does cause inflation. And the answer is velocity, the turnover of money, the lending and the spending. But the problem is velocity is a psychological phenomenon. The Fed can stick the landing on money supply. They can get it down to a couple of decimal places if they want. But if you want to control velocity, which is the key, that's psychological. So, so what you have to do is change the psychology. Well, what is the psychology right now? It's deflationary. Uh, the savings rate in May was 33%. You know, it had, it had been going up. It kind of made its way like from 4% to 7%, but then it spiced to 33%. Well, savings is a good thing. You can drive an economy if you can convert savings into investment. And furthermore, if the investment is productive, unlike what China's doing, uh, but I was, we got some infrastructure or some other projects, R&D, that, that, that would be productive. That can drive an economy. You don't have to drive an economy on consumption. You can drive an economy 
on productive investment. But the problem is twofold. Number one, it, it has a much longer time frame. That's a five, seven year time frame. And it comes in the short run, at least at the expense of consumption. Our economy is driven 70% by consumption. If you substitute savings for consumption, you're killing velocity. Because if I put my money in the bank and leave it there, the velocity is zero. And I remind people $5 trillion or $6 trillion times zero is zero. You can print all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And so the question is, how do you how do you change the psychology? How do you get the – and by the way, it makes sense to say if you're unemployed, you better be saving because you're maybe lucky if you can pay the rent. Uh, but even people who are working or still have their jobs, they're worried, maybe I'm next. You know, Maybe they fired a guy down the hall, but maybe I'm next, and maybe I better save more just in case you know, and so forth. So, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. That makes a lot of sense, but understand what it means. It's deflationary. It reduces velocity. It offsets the increase in the money supply. And it's very hard to get out of. I mean, you know, Keynes called a liquidity trap and he was right. That's what it is. So how do you change the psychology? Well, you need, you need something big. You need something dramatic. That's going to get people to say, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, one of them would be a $5,000 price for gold.